Hey guys, welcome back slash to the channel. I know it's been a couple of days since I have uploaded, so I apologize. I was out getting a really cool kick-ass tattoo and it was awesome. However, it really took it out of me. And then last night I started researching a case and it was just too dark for me. Like if I'm totally honest, not that murder isn't always dark, but sometimes like it contains stuff and I can't mentally handle it. So I backed out of one I was researching and started doing this one instead. Just for my own mental health and probably yours. I don't want to traumatize anybody too much. You know, like this is, I know there's some deeply disturbing cases out there and there's people doing great work with it. However, I'm not that person at the moment. So I apologize. So yeah, I'm on, I'm on a different one that is a little bit easier to digest, even though murder is murder, you know. Um, but yeah. I should insert a picture of my awesome tattoo. It's it's the child from Mandalorian if you guys watch that show. So I absolutely love it. And I'll also put my tattoo artist's um, Instagram link in the description below if you guys want to follow him. He's wonderful. I have another tattoo from him that he did, and he's just great. But yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. Let's get your favorite drink. I got my Drink Up Witches Cup again, which I absolutely love. Once again, Diet Dr. Pepper. I'm filming this a little bit earlier than I usually do because I had this script ready, so I was able to go quicker um, in the day than I usually do because usually I start the afternoon to get all my stuff. Anyways, I'm rambling. Let's get into it. So, sorry for any technical issues that may have caused. Our story starts in Yuma, Arizona in 1997. Now, some fun facts about Yuma. Is this between Phoenix and San Diego? It is considered one of the hottest cities in the U.S. And by hot, I don't mean like Tanzania. I mean, like, you you going to burn up. It's super warm. You know, it's a hot, 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 hot place in Arizona. And it's mainly agricultural. But yeah, um, roughly 96,000 people live there as of now. It is known for its state prison park. And it has some really cool ghost town ruins, actually. And I will insert the screenshot that I found from TripAdvisor on stuff to do there. Uh, just doing some research. Yuma seems cool. I just had very surface level research on that place this time. So the first person we're going to talk about is Kenneth Cloud. He was born in 1942 and he was raised in a farm family. So his family is always doing agricultural stuff. That's how he was raised. He liked that way of life. That's how he was living. His brother said that they at one point had moved across the river to California and then he came back and when Kenneth came back, he got a job at the land reclamation play, uh, got a job at land reclamation after going to junior college in Arizona. So he was back in Yuma. He was running water projects and Kenneth, Kenneth was, you know, enjoying the financial aspect of this, but he always wanted more and he missed farming a lot. He put money aside every month to eventually be able to buy a piece of land he was very budget aware and actually his family at one point called him miserly. So he was a tightwad to say the least. Um, and that seemed to affect his romantic relationships because he at one point was able to get 20 acres with a house, but it was a little crappy house that needed a lot of work, but Kenneth wouldn't allow it. Now, Kenneth and his first wife had four kids, but at one point they got divorced and nobody really knew why. People had assumptions, but they didn't really know why. So by 1976, Kenneth is finding himself living alone in this farm he had bought after his wife and kids had left because his budgeting affected the relationship, it seems like. There's there's no... It comes up later. That's why I'm emphasizing it so much. It definitely comes up later. So just keep that in mind. The next person we're going to talk about is Lois Hay Cloud. Now, she was born in 1949 and also from Yuma. And this was during the time when Yuma was a smaller town. Um, so out west and everything, it used to be a lot less populated. But as time goes on, that's how it goes. By 26, Kay, she, her whole name was Lois Kay, but she went by Kay, had been married twice and was now found herself as a single mother of a daughter and working as a bank teller. So times were a little bit rough for her as far as financial stuff goes. But by chance, Kenneth came to her teller window one time and they hit it off. And this was in 1976. And um, 
they both felt an attraction to each other and started dating. So both of them being married, Kay moved in after a year with her daughter, and they were together seven years before Kenneth and Kay finally got married. People who knew Kay described her as very traditional, like in the way that she carried herself and the role she chose to take in her marriage with Kenneth. She still kept her bank teller job, and actually she was doing really well climbing up the ranks from what it said. But when she went home, like she had dinner there, the house was really clean. She was traditional in that sense, um, described by um, family and friends of the couple. Now, the cool thing at least in Kenneth's eye, is there's two incomes coming in because we have, at this point, Kay's salary and Kenneth's from working the farm, and they're able to keep acquiring it. Eventually, they get over 200 acres out there near Yuma. Um, He really works hard, and he... Not only he's not ju- he's not farming this 200 acres himself by any means. He was really brilliant in the way that he leased out acreages so that other companies and stuff would pay him lease to use his farmland. So he's farming his own portion, and then other people are using it. So he's really raking in the money. Now Kenneth and Kay remained really frugal just to keep growing. Everything went back into the business, which was a big. That was like Kenneth's main thing. It seemed to be like the only thing he cared about overall. Like it, it created everything he did. Kay used to give Kenneth, like she would joke with him and call him a tightwad. And she was joking, but only kind of like, this is Kenneth's track record. He won't put anything out unless he deems it as good for the business. By 1997, Kenneth is worth Roughly $2 million just based off what he owns alone. He thinks Yuma's getting too big and he's getting annoyed because when he was born there, it was fairly rural, agricultural. Now there's all these people moving in, so he's not feeling too happy about it. Kenneth wants to move and retire to some land he acquired in Colorado. That's his ultimate goal. Now, Kay isn't as on board with it, but she's going along with it because... It's her husband. What are you going to do? That's how it kind of seemed. This takes us to the incident. This is how everything went down. So Kenneth and Kay were out doing errands and they were going to go pick up a prescription for Kenneth's father, who is quite elderly and couldn't get it himself. So they went into town to pick up a prescription and then they went to a restaurant to get some food. It was called Burgers and Beer. They seemed really cute, like the patrons that had observed them, you know, just being in there. They walked out arm in arm. They just seemed like a cute couple that had been together for years. And they, at the time, they were parked at the side of the building. So Kenneth and Kay leave. And then people heard really too loud popping noise, pop, pop. All of a sudden, Kay runs back in, covered in blood, her lip nicked, and she is screaming, help me, help me, help me. She's in hysterics at this point. So all the patrons in the restaurant go out to help her. They get to the truck that Kenneth and Kay were in, and Kenneth was slumped over in the driver's seat, blood pouring out of him, clearly deceased. So at that point, the cops come over, and because they were parked on the side, like I said, there's no witnesses. People heard stuff, but there's no witnesses at this time. So... They just have a crime scene. Kay can't describe at all what the gunman looks like. Now, like I said, there's two bullets. One got Kenneth in the neck and somehow, it wasn't quite clear, but um, Kay got her lower lip hit a little bit. Now she's, you know, in shock, really upset, pretty much inconsolable, if you want to say that. Um, So yeah, but she... She goes to the hospital, get her lip taken care of, and then Kay goes to speak to investigators. And I guess at the hospital, that's when they gave her the news that Kenneth was officially declared dead. Like, it was pretty clear when he was there, but that was the official time she was told. Pretty sure she already knew. So Kay, at this point, goes to speak to investigators. And the way Kay describes it is they were both getting in the truck. And actually, they got to the truck and she even gave him a kiss before... She was walking around to the side and she heard a pop 
and she looked up and Ken was over and bleeding and she felt heat right here. It felt really hot because, you know, she she had gotten some debris that hit her lip. And so that's how she remembers it. She didn't see the gunman, but that's that's how everything went. Now, when Kay spoke to the investigators, the investigators described her as kind of flat and cold. However, it should be noted she is on a mild sedative at this point because she was so distraught. They gave that to her, but the police thought it was kind of weird. She was almost joking about it. So they said, you know, a lot of times people can be emotionally drained with that. So she might have been showing it, but the investigators felt like it was really unusual for a grieving widow to be so nonchalant about what had, nonchalant about what had just happened. And her joke was, oh, I'm a blonde. That's why I didn't see the shooter. <laughs> Hilarious, Kay. Now, at this point, she's sitting in the investigation room. The investigator goes, okay, which one of you is having an affair? And then Kay goes, <laughs> starts laughing, like, uncomfortably, right? And she goes, well, I certainly am not, but maybe Kenneth was. So she just pushes that right over. Something Kay didn't think about or didn't know about was there was a witness that was happening to be driving by during the shooting. Now, it was a person on a bicycle, a young man, apparently, and he heard a pop. And he turned around because he thought it was going to be somebody trying to break into a car because just the, he said like the area of town. So he turned to see it and he turned and he, this is how he described him. I want to say this, like, I don't want anybody to think, uh, um, he described a heavy set Hispanic man putting a gun in his something in his waistband. No, he didn't say a gun. I have a spoiler alert, but obviously Kenneth was shot. So this is what he saw. Now the investigators are a little um, disappointed with this description because over half the population of Yuma is Hispanic. And a lot of people that work the farms there also would fit this description. So they didn't think it got very narrowed down. And at this point, the investigators were even wondering if maybe Kenneth was somehow tied to the drug cartels because they're like, why Why would they shoot like just this random farmer? It seemed really weird. And the investigators couldn't find any tie into the cartel. He, he was completely clean um, from everything they got. So the case was starting to just kind of dissipate. They're not getting anywhere at this point until investigators get a call from a woman named Charlene. Now, let me tell you about this call. She said to look at Vincent Arcada and... She had met him two years ago. Here's her reasoning why she told the cops that they should look into him. When Charlene met him, he had reported himself to be an, a millionaire. But the weird thing was, for a millionaire, he had no money. And he claimed it was all tied up in inheritance. He had forged documents showing he was a millionaire that he carried around. But he's a scam artist. Now, the reason why Charlene wanted the cops to look at Vincent is Charlene hearing that Vincent needed this help, brought him into a bank. You can probably see where this is going and introduced him to a bank clerk named Kay Cloud. So Charlene can clearly see that this is a connection because Charlene herself introduced Vincent to Kay. Now let's look at the relationship between Vincent and Kay. Like I said before, Ricardo was a scammer. Like this is known. And when they looked further into it... Vincent happened to be staying across the street from Burgers and Beer the night of the shooting. And now another thing, too, is Kay had rented a car at this point. She went into town. So when investigators went to go talk to the car rental place, they asked to the, the clerk who had given Kay the rental car to describe Kay and the other person that she, she had come in with. Now, because the, the clerk had been describing a couple. The clerk described Vincent, not Kenneth. So suspicions are going high. That's looking strange. Investigators now talk to Ken's friends and family and just try to get more information on Kenneth as a person and Kenneth and Kay's relationship. Even his closest friends and family, like brothers, sisters, close friends, described Kenneth as an absolute tightwad. Like, 
to the point where he was a bit of an ass. Anytime Kay wanted anything, she had to take it out of her own money down to going out for dinner, clothing, any type of anything. And these weren't even luxury items. These are just, you know, basic necessities of living day to day. He wouldn't do anything. He put all that on Kay and everybody do that. Um, and apparently at one point, Kenneth and Kay, this is actually not long before the incident at all. I think it's, it, they said it was between a couple weeks and a month. They had actually seeked counseling and even went to a couple's retreat. And it did not go well. Like, they felt like they didn't get anywhere when Kenneth's brother described how Ken had told him about the retreat. It sounded like it did not go out well at all. And Kenneth was also aware that Kay had taken out 6K in the account. And he knew about it and he didn't know how to address it to her. Now, at this point, the investigators are thinking that 6K was used... To hire Vincent. That's what the investigators are starting to suspect. They can't confirm it, but they're starting to suspect it. So with all this new information, Kay is questioned a second time. Now, Kay said, yeah, I know Vincent. We were just friends. She visited him at his hotel room and said it was totally innocent and platonic. Everything's fine. Something that uh, forensic investigators picked up on was the movement of funds right after Kenneth died, like, boom, right after he died, all of a sudden money's going back and forth and back and forth between all these accounts. Kay was seen purchasing super nice things. She got a car for her daughter. She moved into town in Yuma. She's selling off plots of land. She's buying Vincent. She bought him, get this, a motorcycle and a Lincoln. So she's freaking dropping dough. She also sold that land in Colorado because guess what? Kay didn't want to have any part of that dream of Kenneth's of moving to Colorado. That was not her jam. She didn't want anything to do with it. Now, at this point, Kenneth's family's getting super concerned because Kenneth, his kids, that was going to be part of their inheritance. But at this point, Kay is the sole inheritor of everything. So she's... She's living her best life, unfortunately, at the expense of others. At this point, Vincent knows that uh, the cops are on to him. So he flees Yuma and they can't find him for a while. He's just out of there and they can't do anything to Kay unless they have a murderer. So they they know some shit is up with Kay, right? Like 100%. But without Vincent, they can't do a whole lot. So for years at this point... Investigators keep looking at Kay's phone records and everything stays clean until she messes up one day. They find a strange number they haven't seen before and they trace it to be a prepaid burner phone she had purchased years ago. And she messed up by using her regular cell phone to check her voicemails. So now the police get a warrant and are able to pull the records from that phone. And they found on that burner, that burner is only calling one number. And the number is tied to McAllen, Texas. So at this point, they have another warrant issue to tap those phone calls. They tap in. Now, police want to bait Vincent and Kay a little bit because they're, I mean, this stuff's coming in on a silver platter. They just need certain things to align. That's how it's going. They put a newspaper about this cold case murder trial in the paper. They make sure it gets published because they know that this will make them, this will light a fire on their, under their ass a little bit. So they do that. At this point, remember the phones are tapped, or at least the burner phone is tapped. Kay calls Vincent because they're in and Vincent says they are closer than I thought. Now at this point, Vincent um, is doing, I love you, blah, 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 you know, all the bullshit that you would say um, if you're heavily manipulating a person. And he is urging, during this call, he's urging Kay to also sell the rest of the farm property that she's still holding on to. Now, at this point, Vincent tries to flee again. But guess what? There's officers staked out everywhere. So he ain't going nowhere. He tries. He, uh, He tries to go to Mexico. But the police pull him over and arrest him. So his ass going back to Yuma. And at this point, they got Vincent. Kay's coming in. So this all happened in 1997. Two years prior, Vincent went to trial for being the hitman in this case and was charged with first degree murder 
and got the death penalty. At least he's charged for the death penalty at this point. 2010 comes in and Kay's on trial. So it's roughly 12 years after the murder. It's It happened, I believe it was October or November, and it's February 2010. Um, and... In the commentary, I heard people were talking about how much it had aged Kay. She went from, you know, a slightly older woman to looking like a straight up grandma, like in a wheelchair. She's got hearing aids in. she's got all sorts of stuff going in. I'm going to insert footage the best I can. But yeah, she's definitely, all of this has taken a toll on her, whether it's guilt or just stress or both. It is weighing heavy on Kay. Now, an interesting thing they couldn't fully pin all of this. They couldn't get Vincent to crack. He would not out Kay at all. He would not fess up to the murder. And he also would not include Kay in any of the involvement. So even though he got all that, he didn't crack. So she's had that going for her a little bit. Now the prosecution goes after Kay strong. They bring up, she was clearly having an affair with Ricardo and... He just never fessed up to it. They claim that was the main motive, was her and Ricardo wanting to start a whole new life. And they claim that that last dinner at Burgers and Beer was all set up. And like I said, they even, you know, when Kenneth and Kay were about to go to the opposite sides of the truck, as you do when you get in a car, she actually kissed him. And somebody described it as a Judas kiss. And that, I mean, that is, that really sums it up because she... In my opinion, that totally fits. The other motive that they lean on is that she was the sole inheritor, as I stated before, of everything of Kenneth's um, at that moment. So, yeah, not only that, she got life insurance with it paid out, plus the two million Kenneth was worth. And they, when the forensic accounting went in, they couldn't trace $600,000. I mean, they were already watching her do stuff. They could trace some of it, right? But $600,000 thousand dollars went unaccounted for something else that uh the prosecution did is they played those tapped phone calls that the police had made on the burner phone and those are super incriminating it shocked the jury because up to this point i think a lot of people are half and half because you have this sweet innocent looking grandma and then they played the phone calls and the reporters that were there at the time claimed that it it really started turning the tides of how this verdict was going to come out. Now, at this point, the defense has their argument. And they claim Ricardo completely acted alone. They said they leaned on Kay's, how she's looking at this moment, said she was just this sweet woman who was vulnerable, and he completely took advantage of her. And at this point, Kay takes a stand, which is kind of shocking. She claims she always loved Ken. Even when he was mean to her or ignored her or didn't give her money, she said her love was enduring no matter what. She admitted she was very charmed by Vincent when she met him in the bank, but they were still just friends. Now, Kay also said that she had confided in Vincent that she was ready to leave Ken because he was being cruel. She said she loved him, but she was ready to re leave him. And she was very emotional over the night of the murder. And she said that she confronted Vincent over her husband dying. And Vincent told her he didn't do it. She claimed she just wanted Vincent to say no and that she did want his companionship. So at this point, Kay kind of gets trapped in her own lie and the fact that she was clearly having an affair with Vincent. And Kay thought that Vincent loved her. She said she just, sorry, my camera cut out again. It really likes to do that. So Kay said that she loved Vincent and that's why she was giving him money and stuff. And she also, Vincent told her that the mafia was after him, the Chicago mafia, I believe, for gambling debts and such. So she was trying to help him. And she, she said she never feared the police, but she did fear the mafia. So she said when she was arrested, she was actually expecting a hitman to come after her. Another thing that got brought up by the defense is not even, it wasn't even a year after Kenneth's death. Vincent and Kay actually get married, but it has no legal standing because at this point, Vincent had been married multiple times before and then never divorced anybody. So it wasn't a legal marriage at all. So the defense tried to lean on that. Now, it took a while to get to the verdict and people contemplated it, but the verdict turned out being 
Kay was found guilty of first degree murder and she got life in prison without parole. Now, Kenneth's family was pretty upset about this because they wanted her to have the death penalty. Now, they were super upset with Kay, but Kenneth's brother also admitted that Vincent had a huge part in this, so he couldn't fully place the blame on her. Now, as far as I know, or as far as I could find, I should say, Kay's still in prison, but Vincent died on death row in 2011 from a heart attack. So he was on death row, but didn't get to any time before natural causes just took him out. My thoughts on this, I feel like, uh, ooh, Kay was completely wrong. And I don't, it almost found, it sounded like she felt so deprived. It ended up being a bit of a, almost a revenge killing in a way because she had felt deprived and neglected so much from Kenneth. I think you should just get a fucking divorce though, okay? Like this weird, I guess it's not technically a love triangle because Kenneth had no idea Vincent existed or anything, but like I felt like Vincent viewed Kay as a sugar mama and he was enough of a sociopath. He'd kill. He didn't give a shit. And uh, poor Kenneth got in the way. However, Kenneth was not innocent either. I mean, that saying happy wife, happy life, there's absolute truth to that. Does it mean he deserved to be murdered? Hell no, it doesn't. That's so wrong. I feel this is, ugh, things got hairy too quick. Nobody was doing the right thing and everybody paid for it in the end. It is tragic and sad and I feel bad for Kenneth's family. And though I understand the motive, n murder's never justified. That's never okay. So, I mean, Kay's still rotten in prison and Vincent's dead. And I guess that's just karma, right? I don't know. That's, that's cold to say, but it's just the truth. I mean, if you're willing to kill and then lie about it and then spend all that money and like screw over your murdered husband's kids through selling off their inheritance for your own benefit, you're a shitty person. Sorry, Kay. I, yeah. So there's that moral of the story, just get a divorce. Just get a fucking divorce. You could take them for half at least. I mean, come on. Unless there were, there was no prenup or anything. It was 76 when they got married. She could take a lot of money from him. I don't know why she just didn't do that. Ugh. Anyways, <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. I always appreciate it. Thank you for taking time out of your day and watching me. And I hope to see you again real soon. Bye.